Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the first in our series of webinars on new perspectives on US-China relations hosted by the University of Pennsylvania Center for the Study of Contemporary China. I'm Jacques Delisle, I'm director of the center uh, and we're delighted to welcome you again to the first of what will be six webinars every Friday at 1230. On behalf of Avery Goldstein, my predecessor is director of the center and my colleague in this project, and Nason Makbubi, who's another fellow, another uh, colleague at our China Center. Uh, and on behalf of all the 20 or so participants and, and project staff, we're delighted to be able uh, to bring you this series of Friday webinars, which are a big part of uh, this project on the future of US-China relations and especially on US policy toward China. It's something of a cliche to say the US-China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world, but like many cliches, it has the virtue of being true. And we're talking about it at a truly a pivotal moment. It's no secret probably to anyone who's tuned into this webinar that US-China relations are not in a good state. We've moved into a period when the prior American consensus in favor of engaging China and the belief that uh, bringing China into the international system as a potential partner, uh, that that has come under increasing doubt and the relationship is now fraught by a number of disputes over a huge range of issues. So a big relationship at a pivotal moment. And it is also a relationship that is extremely complex, ranging across a huge number of issue areas. And so we're delighted to be able to address those by bringing together a group of 20 scholars uh, and a policy think tank uh, uh, staffers who are really able, I think, to bring a new set of perspectives to these issues. And our goal in assembling this group, uh, a guideline more than a rule perhaps, but we put together a group that I think does bring together a new generation of thinking on these issues uh, and people who bring to this enterprise a, the kind of academic depth that a younger generation of China scholars now has in specific subfields and a degree of policy relevance that is uh, an important supplement to the kind of academic work that uh, that we all see quite frequently on these topics. And this uh, group ranges across the full spectrum of current contentious and significant issues, we believe, in US-China relations. We divided it into six categories, each of which will be the focus of one of our weekly webinars. So I don't want to occupy any more time with this kind of background, except to say that we are grateful for the support for this project, the generous support we've, we've received from Penn Global, the Penn Provost Office, China Research and Engagement Fund, and from the Henry Luce Foundation. So without further ado, I will turn it over to my colleague and predecessor, Avery Goldstein, who will moderate today's panel with our four panelists on national security issues. At the conclusion of today's presentation, the conclusion of today's webinar, you'll be able to find the policy papers by these four panelists on our website, and we'll be posting policy papers uh, each week uh, as we go forward with our October series, our September uh, series and our October surprise series, a total of six webinars once again. So without further ado, Avery. Great, thanks Jacques. Um, uh, what I'm gonna do is briefly introduce today's panelists. Uh, if you want their full bios, they're available on the website for the project. And then what I've uh, set up as the ground rules is I'm gonna ask each of the authors of the papers that uh, were written for today's panel uh, to very briefly uh, summarize what they see as the key points they tried to convey in their work. And then after that, um, I'll ask them a couple of questions. And when we finish up with each of the papers doing that, uh, then we'll open it up to the uh, questions from the viewers out there. And as it says uh, on the chat function, if you've checked it, uh, you'll be able to use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen there on the ribbon uh, to post your questions, and then we'll get to them uh, for the last portion of, of the program. Uh, so this is the panel on national security, and we, we construe that fairly broadly in this case. It's not focused on narrow military affairs, but really looking at the uh, strategic interactions between the United States and China, the challenges for American policy, uh, including the challenges posed by the realities in China, looking at national interests, looking at politics, as well as looking at some of the military aspects of the relationship. Uh, let me first introduce all four panelists. Uh, you can see their names there on the screen. Uh, Jessica Chen Weiss, I'm going to introduce them in the order they'll be speaking. Jessica Chen Weiss is Associate Professor of Government at Cornell University. Her work focuses on Chinese politics and foreign relations with an emphasis on nationalism and public opinion. And she looks at the connection between domestic politics and international relations. Uh, she's also uh, a Washington Post Monkey Cage blog editor and a non-resident senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Ryan Haas is senior editor to uh, senior advisor, excuse me, to McClarty Associates and the Scowcroft Group, focusing on China. He's a fellow with the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. 
Uh, previously, he served as Director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the National Security Council staff and prior to joining the uh, NSC. Uh, he served as Foreign Service Officer, uh, Foreign Service Officer uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Uh, Joel Joel Wuthnow is a research fellow at, in the Center for the Study of Chinese Military Affairs at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University in the United States. Uh, he focuses on Chinese foreign and security policy, Chinese military affairs, U.S.-China relations, and strategic developments in East Asia. Uh, he also serves as an adjunct professor at the Eisenhower School at NDU, as well as at the Edmund Walsh School for Foreign Service at Georgetown University. And our fourth panelist is Fiona Cunningham, who is an assistant professor of political science and international affairs at the George Washington University. And her research examines the intersection of technology uh, and conflict with a substantive focus on China. She was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University and is currently a Stanton Fellow, uh, Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. So without any more uh, uh, of these kinds of theatrics, let's turn to the panel and begin with Jessica. Um, Jessica, your paper was on uh, nationalism and the domestic politics of Chinese foreign policy lessons for the United States. So if you'd like to take uh, two, three minutes to just quickly uh, hit the highlights of your paper as you see them. Thanks so much. And again, for putting together this project, it's such an important time. Uh, the takeaway really of my paper is that US policy toward China needs to be grounded in a strategic assessment of nationalism and domestic politics in Xi Jinping's China. In the long term, nationalism will undermine China's search for global leadership and influence and already Beijing faces a global backlash over its crackdown in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, its activities in the South China Sea and in the Himalayas. But this brash diplomacy, along with repression and xenophobia, really are undermining China's efforts to project an image of benevolent leadership. Still in the short term, Chinese nationalism poses challenges for US deterrence and leverage, because the more that an issue resonates with domestic nationalist sensitivities, the more likely that foreign threats uh, are to provoke rather than deter. And so while Beijing may use bluster and other symbolic measures to temporarily appease domestic audiences, it may also increase uh, nationalism and nationalist demands for conflict later. So as such, I recommend that US efforts to deter China be conducted in ways that minimize domestic pressure on the Chinese government to respond to what they will call provocations. And Washington, I think, should be especially careful not to imply that US policy seeks regime change in China because that could backfire by rallying domestic audiences around Xi Jinping rather than demanding that the CCP uh, address all sorts of acute domestic problems ranging from unemployment to uh, pollution. And it's important to note that China is not a monolith. And so far from um, a purported Beijing consensus, there's a spectrum of domestic opinion, ideology, and interests inside China. And so as US policymakers think about policy, we need to think about carefully how different courses of action will affect these domestic dynamics and debate inside China about how China should use its growing power and influence. So ultimately, to reduce the risk of war with China, to reverse the decline in Washington's global power and prestige, and to restore trust in US democracy here at home, the United States ought to adopt what I and Ali Wine have called an asymmetric strategy uh, that avoids mirror imaging Beijing's worst tendencies. Because a strategy that's based on tit for tat, strict reciprocity, ends up ceding the initiative to Beijing and risking a race to the bottom. And ultimately it sacrifices the very values of openness and liberalism that US policy is aiming to protect. And so in particular where the United States has comparative strengths in education and innovation and uh, scientific research, the United States ought to avoid policies that seem to try to out China China, as Ali and I recently wrote in the New York Times. And I think that US policymakers ought to be especially careful that efforts to punish China in the name of reciprocity do not hurt more than help US values of interests. Great, thanks. Thanks, Jessica. So I'm gonna ask some questions and I, I kind of warn the panelists, they may seem a little bit uh, as though I'm challenging some of their arguments, but really I'm trying to draw them out a bit maybe go a little bit beyond what's in the papers themselves. So I think one of the core um, parts of your paper is this focus on the idea that there's a spectrum of opinion uh, on many issues within China's foreign policy uh, establishment uh, and that it, understanding that diversity along the spectrum can be useful in tailoring American policy. So for me, that prompts two questions. First, 
Um, do we have any evidence uh, from past experience that outsiders can successfully play to those divisions in, uh, in opinion within China to shape China's choices in ways that would in fact serve American interests? And then secondly, kind of a related question is, even if that was true in the past, might there be some reason to believe that as we've moved from the era of Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao to, to Xi Jinping, that perhaps the diversity of uh, opinions uh, within the Chinese elite, maybe even within the Chinese public, matters less under uh, the leadership of Xi Jinping where he's more or less in charge? That's a great set of questions. And I think we have seen in the past that uh, foreign policy pressures can in fact work with domestically aligned interests for policies that move uh, Beijing in directions that outside actors would like to see, whether that's uh, on currency appreciation or climate change. Uh, rarely does international pressure work where there isn't also um, a domestic constituency that is pushing for those changes. Otherwise, it, it looks like it's you know, the outside array against uh, Chinese interests. Now, of course, there, it's an important question as to whether or not there can be uh, you know, similar domestic divisions today that could be utilized in such a strategy. And I think there we have to be very uh, you know, cognizant that in fashioning US policy to ostensibly help those inside China that may be hurt under the current regime. We're not, we're not doing further harm uh, by, you know, making it easy uh, for those uh, domestic interests to be painted as uh, simply the work of, you know, outside black hands. And I think that we, there's a real risk, for example, you know, in Hong Kong or another ways to try to help uh, so-called liberals in China uh, that, that U.S. policy or outside actors could do more harm uh, than help. And so here it is really about, I think, pushing where there seems to be, uh, you know, common cause, common shared interests, and being much more calibrated and judicious um, in other areas where uh, their, you know, U.S. policy faces really a lot, really united, uh, sort of what I would call central or low heterogeneity issues, um, particularly surrounding China's so-called core interests. Uh, another question uh, that comes out of a, a large portion of what you discuss in the paper is how to, how to deal with Chinese rhetoric and, and understand shifts in Chinese rhetoric and how to, to parse what they're saying. Uh, and you indicate, I think, very usefully the idea that you should pay close attention to when, uh, thing, when Chinese statements seem to go against type or to depart from uh, what people had expected someone to say. Um, but you also say that sometimes these are um, tactical attempts at moderating uh, rhetoric or tactically adjusting to some of the, uh, the pushback that China may be encountering. Um, let me, as devil's advocate or maybe a hawk's advocate, um, play the role here and say, well, uh, if that's true, if it's just a tactical moderation in rhetoric, uh, shouldn't we instead ignore trying to parse what the Chinese leaders might be saying in the language they're using and simply focus on China's capabilities and what we believe to be their intentions rather than be deluded uh, by the rhetoric that is really directed at domestic audiences in China? Well, I think it's certainly important to take with a large grain of salt Chinese rhetoric uh, and not to take Chinese rhetoric grand slogans as a blueprint of China's intentions because this rhetoric is, as you say, meant in large part for domestic audiences. But rhetoric can also be a constraining factor. It, it is much more difficult for the leadership to change rhetoric on a dime. So in, a, in an in evolving uh, crisis scenario, for example, it may find itself somewhat trapped by the benchmarks that have been laid out, but that over the medium to long term, there's a lot of flexibility and pragmatism in the interpretation of existing slogans and the articulation of new ones. So there's a, I think a middle ground here where we need to look at both rhetoric and behavior to try to assess and triangulate on China's underlying intentions rather than taking either in isolation. Okay. Um, so you, you open the paper kind of optimistically, uh, or at least you know, that there is an optimistic spin in this paper, which is that uh, in fact, in, in the long run, um, you know, the emphasis on the more nationalistic, more aggressive nationalistic impulses by the Chinese leadership is gonna undercut uh, China's own interest in expanding its uh, global prestige, its global influence. Um, again, trying to play the role of devil's advocate here. Um, suppose somebody would say, well, when, when will that happen? Uh, you know, John Maynard Keynes, I guess, is identified with saying in the long run, we're all dead. What about in the near to medium term, uh, if in fact Chinese nationalist rhetoric is reinforcing Chinese assertive behavior, 
can we afford to uh, wait out this kind of impulse in China, or do we simply have to deal with, I guess, as uh, Mike Pompeo or Mike Pence put it, do we have to deal with the China that we face, not the China we wished we faced? Mm. Well, I think that you can see some of the self-limiting tendencies in Chinese nationalism already accruing to Beijing. This is not something that we face 10 or 20 years down the line, but right now, uh, the kind of, even Chinese internal reporting uh, notes that anti-China sentiment is at its highest level since 1989 with the crackdown in Tiananmen. And so, uh, you know, we may yet see signs of, uh, you know, more tactical moderation or recognition that the kind of nationalism that China has been displaying is not serving China's national interests. Um, and so, but, you know, ultimately, I think what we have to fear is an even more aggressive, I know that may be hard to believe, but an even more aggressive expansionistic form of Chinese nationalism. Right now, Chinese rhetoric still, at this, you know, ostensibly allows for a diversity of regime types to coexist. Uh, and we aren't seeing the kind of uh, forcible export of a China model. And so, you know, that is, that in principle allows for some kind of coexistence, although I, despite the current administration's rhetoric about this being an existential, you live, I die kind of battle. Now, should we see that more kind of expansive beyond the kinds of existing territorial claims, sovereignty claims that the Chinese government has stood by for decades? That's the kind of nationalism that I think we really need to be most concerned about. Not that the current nationalism is not problematic, but it is self-limiting. Uh, this other form of, of nationalism, I think would be far more uh, destructive and um, you know, devastating to the, to the global system. Okay, but last question, uh, because I'm bumping up against your time limit here. Um, and it really turns things around and looks at the United States and uh, maybe someone would say this is a reflection of the constraints of nationalism in the United States or something like that. Uh, one of the recommendations, central recommendations you offer to American policymakers is to avoid counterproductive provocations uh, that will trigger these nationalist impulses uh, from China. Uh, and that in doing that, you argue that American policymakers should um, um, wield a scalpel rather than, a, than a, a hammer or a sledgehammer, something I can't remember the exact term. Um, my question is, is that realistic given American, uh, the state of American politics today? Or are there the just very strong incentives in American politics uh, for both Congress and the president to be seen wielding a hammer when dealing with China rather than a scalpel? Mm. Well, I have, all I have to say there is that we cannot give in to our despair. That if we believe that all that can be done with China is a hammer rather than a scalpel, then we've essentially ceded not only uh, the fact that this is going to reverberate and produce a more nationalistic China, but it's also going to be undoing the very, uh, you know, principles of, uh, you know, rule of law, liberalism, openness that the United States is ostensibly standing for. And so, to you know, U.S. policymakers and politicians, there's there there is still, I think, an important distinction between campaigning, where we may allow politicians a little bit of leeway in terms of their rhetoric and in terms of governing. Um, and so, how is it that the various agencies that are tasked with, um, you know, combating the worst uh, sort of excesses of of Chinese influence or espionage, intellectual property theft, what are the policy? Uh, levers that are being fashioned and how um, how blunt and sweeping are they? Obviously, the rhetoric itself is very harmful. It affects attitudes, um, both among in the U.S. electorate as well as uh, Chinese students and scholars here. Is not just even Chinese, but all international students and scholars. I think uh, you know feel the kind of the the ill wind um, when policy is made and directed at uh, you know students and scholars of foreign nationalities. Um, and so I, I would just say we have to do better. I think there is a broad recognition that we have to do better. And I think that sort of precision will allow us to want to address some of the real concerns, um, you know, whether it's Chinese censorship or, uh, you know, theft or espionage, while still uh, preserving and in, in even strengthening uh, the U.S. system as a liberal democratic alternative. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Jessica. Uh, now we're going to turn to Ryan and his paper. Uh, Ryan Haas's paper entitled Lessons from the Trump Administration's Policy Experimental in China. Uh, and Ryan, uh, you've got uh, three minutes or so to give us the short version. 
Well, thank you, Avery, and also Jock and Mason for including me in this project. It's really um, a privilege for me to be with such a distinguished group uh, with Jessica, Joel, Fiona, you. Um, I actually want to start uh, by introducing the topic by rewinding the tape a bit to November 2016. And I was in Lima, Peru at the time. I had just traveled uh, with President Obama for his final meeting with Xi Jinping. And the meeting ended, I went back up to my ho hotel room. I may or may not have had a beer in my hand and I was watching the news and the news came on and President Trump started talking about how, you know, he's gonna be tough and muscular and put the Chinese in their place and he'll use 40% tariffs. He'll do whatever is needed to, uh, to, to take care of China uh, like, uh, like no one before. And it really sort of made me wonder, uh, is there something that we missed uh, in, in the Obama administration or previous administrations? Will this work better? And we now have the benefit of four years of uh, an experiment to take a look at. Uh, the results. And that's what this paper tries to do, to draw some preliminary judgments about how well this, this new project has worked. So I'm just going to offer three thoughts to try to kick off our conversation about this experiment. The first is that I think that President Trump's approach represents the boldest effort of any American president in the past 40 years to reset the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, anyone who watches the U.S.-China relationship can recognize how busy he and members of his team have been on China. Uh, a former Republican Party cabinet level official commented to me recently that uh, he thought that President Trump's shift on China represented the sharpest shift without a precipitating act of war that he could recall uh, over the course of his life. And I, I don't think that's entirely an exaggeration. Uh, President Trump has uh, raised awareness about the risks that China poses to the United States and others. Uh, he has drawn attention to the problems of being over-reliant on China in certain areas. And I think that uh, his efforts have led to greater international scrutiny about China's overseas behavior and some of its ambitions. But overall, uh, I guess my judgment is uh, I'm not yet convinced that we find ourselves in a better spot. Um, and by, what I mean by that is that by the Trump administration's own acknowledgement, uh, China's behavior has grown worse in recent years, uh, more repressive at home, more assertive abroad. Uh, China has become less restrained in pursuit of its ambitions, less responsive to American concerns. Areas of cooperation in the U.S.-China relationship are effectively nil. Uh, areas of confrontation have intensified. And the capacity of the two countries to manage their differences has really uh, been degraded. And so this is the third and final point, which is the lesson I take away from, from this experiment isn't that we need to turn back the clock uh, to some previous period. Uh, I think China has changed, America has changed, the world has changed. That's not an available option. Um, but I think what we need to do, what a Washington Post op-ed today commented on, which is take the raised awareness that President Trump has provided and begin to craft solutions to the problems uh, that have been put at the forefront. And that's where I, I hope uh, the United States will begin to turn in the years to come. Great. Um, well, thanks for the summary of the paper. Um, and I'm going to take most of my questions are going to reflect this idea of the, the Trump administration's uh, China policy being this grand experiment uh, to try to do it differently, uh, to say it, to put it mildly. Uh, and I guess one of my questions here is uh, how much is, was this? You, know, you begin the paper saying that this was propelled by Trump's victory in 2016. Um, was a big change in the offing anyway? I mean, if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, uh, would many of these changes, in fact, have played out uh, without President Trump and his advisors being in office? And if you look at some of the things that were being written by folks who were affiliated with the Democratic, Par Democratic Party at the time, uh, the Eli Campbell, uh, excuse me, Eli Ratner, Kurt Campbell article, things like that. I mean, you talk about six innovations that are part of this Trump-China policy experiment. Um, would most of those six innovations, in fact, have been undertaken uh, under a different president? I can answer that shortly. No. Ah, okay. um, I, I, I think that President Trump brings a lot of unique attributes to the relationship. Um, diplomacy by Twitter being one of them. A, a fixation on the trade balance as a measure of fairness uh, is a very unique characteristic uh, of President Trump. Uh, the idea that, um, that 
traditional state to state diplomacy doesn't really matter that much uh, is a very unique attribute of the Trump administration uh, that I don't think would have been reflected in any other administration. Uh, the idea that uh, China can sort of be set to the side and we can deal directly with North Korea and Iran to solve the problems that we have with them is a very unique uh, feature of a Trump mindset. Uh, the elevation of reciprocity to sort of a, um, you know, tip of the pinnacle uh, in, term, in terms of overall importance, I think is something that uh, President Trump brought to the relationship that uh, I'm not convinced others would have. And then finally, this um, ideological overlay to the relationship, uh, this view that uh, it's in America's interest to try to separate the Chinese Communist Party from the Chinese people, I think is also a very unique attribute uh, of the Trump administration's approach. So that's sort of a long way of my glib response, which is that I think that President Trump actually brings a lot of unique attributes to the relationship that uh, I don't expect others would have. Okay, so what you're telling me is uh, that I'd be wrong if I were speculating that it would make a difference if someone else had won the election in 2016. But um, let's flip it around and look at the Chinese side. And um, you, know, you, you point out in the paper that in fact, the, uh, the, uh, the Trump, President Trump's innovations have not succeeded in accomplishing uh, their most important objectives. Um, and that would in part be the idea that they could shape China's behavior and China's choices in certain ways that the Trump administration was seeking. But I'm wondering about the counterfactual there. Um, do we have any reason to think that had American policy been different, that the Chinese would have behaved um, differently? I was going to say better. Would they behave differently in ways that were uh, more to a, the liking of American policymakers? In other words, is this perhaps is China's behavior that hasn't changed um, mostly driven by what China wants to do rather than what American policy is? Well, Avery, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought this up because uh, it's a really important point and something that we should, as a group, spend some time pondering. Um, one thing that I don't want my paper to suggest is that the deterioration in the U.S.-China relationship or the overall condition of things is all President Trump's fault. Um, I, I certainly don't associate with that view, and I, um, as critical as I am of some of the Trump administration's decisions, I think that it was China, not the United States, that uh, incarcerated over a million Uyghurs. It was China, not the United States, that took actions against Hong Kong. Uh, it's been China, not the United States, that has inflamed tensions in various uh, areas around its periphery. So uh, I'm, I, I am very much, I think, of the spirit of the question that you're asking. Um, that said, I do think that when the relationship has been reduced to unvarnished rivalry, with a heavy dimension of zero sum, I win, you lose uh, attitude to it, it reduces uh, the incentive for restraint on the part of China. Uh, it lowers the risk for them to take actions that could tilt the, the relationship into an adversarial spiral. Because from their perspective, it's already there. Uh, there's nothing that China could or could not do that would alter um, the, the instincts and impulses of the Trump administration towards China. So therefore, why not act on their ambitions? Uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's an area that we should explore and, and really grapple with because, um, you know, it is a fact that, uh, that previous uh, Chinese administrations were not uh, as active in pursuit of their ambitions as we have seen in the past couple of years. Okay, now I'm going to focus on the American side of the policy making. I mean, you have a lot of experience dealing with people in the U.S. government uh, in, the, in, the, in the China game here. Um, and you mentioned that, uh, at one point in the paper that you had um, a conversation, I guess, with someone as an insider in the Trump administration who was about to be, who basically previewed the, the, the grand experiment here and said, you know, we're going to go big or go home. Um, and, you know, if it doesn't work, well, we can always go back to something more normal. And I'm wondering, do you think that is the mindset of most who undertook this, the Trump experiment on China policy? Or were they really not doing this with an eye to, well, if it doesn't work out, we can go back to doing the normal stuff? That in fact, what they were trying to do was to lock the United States into a path from which it would be very difficult to return to what predecessors had done. Well, I'm, um, I always, am challenged to talk about the Trump administration as a monolith because it's really, you know, a composite of many different parts and many different pieces that all have their own views and, and uh, priorities as it relates to China. Um, I think that President Trump, uh, you know, he sort of sits above a, a lot of the action and debate that occurs within his administration. Uh, 
And for for several years, there was uh, you know a a very open, visible division uh, that I guess the press referred to as the globalist versus the nativist or the hawks. But basically, the attitude was you know should we have a a balanced relationship with China or not? Uh, in a post-COVID-19 world, uh, those cleavages appear to have been erased, and we, we appear to have a more monolithic approach by the Trump administration towards China, with President Trump more, more engaged uh, and associated with that effort. Um, but, you know, I think that there are a significant number of people within the Trump administration who approach the relationship with a belief, a conviction that, um, that the United States and China are locked into a deep ideological and philosophical competition where there will be a winner and a loser. And if the United States does not prevail, China will be able to impose its views and its values on the international system in a way that will make uh, America uh, look and act differently in the world. And so um, I take them at their word that uh, that, that is the, the concern or the fear that animates a lot of their uh, decision making on, on China. Great, thanks. All right, uh, now we're gonna move on to our third paper and panelist. Uh, and of course, we'll come back to, to all these other topics uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and so Joel, you're up. And uh, let me get my glasses so I can read, get the title of your paper correct before I read it. Uh, Joel's paper is entitled US-China Military Relations in an Era of Strategic Competition. So Joel, um, you've got a little bit of time to summarize your arguments. Hmm. Okay, well, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Avery. Thanks, Jacques, for involving me in this exciting project. Uh, so my paper is looking at a fairly narrow uh, slice of the overall relationship, which is um, relations between our two militaries. Um, military relations, to be blunt, is an area that we can't afford to get wrong. Uh, if it's working successfully, uh, communicating with the PLA, I think, can be an important hedge against an accident or a miscalculation involving U.S. and Chinese forces. Uh, just as by talking with the Soviets, we were able to find ways to operate safely near them during the latter half of the Cold War. Uh, with China, this isn't just a worry in theory, it's happened before. Um, now we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the EP3 incident, uh, which involved a loss of life on the Chinese side. There was a 10-day crisis that overshadowed every other aspect of our relations with China, and it was solved only with great difficulty um, after the U.S. issued a statement of regret. And that was in a better stage of our relations with China. We can only imagine uh, how such an incident would unfold today when we're in the midst of more of a strategic competition, which side would be willing to back down first. Uh, and such an incident reoccurring today, I think, uh, could not only be more dangerous, but might, might actually become more likely. Um, in mid-2020, there were nine uh, problem encounters uh, in the South China Sea, and the clock may be ticking before one of these really spins out of control. So the two militaries need to talk to determine how those kinds of incidents can be avoided uh, and how, if they do happen, we can de-escalate the situation without a further loss of life. Uh, to their credit, I think the last few administrations have taken this problem very seriously. Um, I give particular credit uh, to the Obama administration um, and a shout out here to Ryan for his role in this, for setting up rules uh, for safe aerial and maritime encounters. Uh, Department of Defense right now, I think, has placed this at the top, very top of the military to military agenda and rightly so. Uh, but there are some problems. Um, one is that great power competition uh, has greatly reduced uh, the quantity and the quality and the scope of our exchanges with the PLA. Uh, we're doing a lot less with them uh, than we did only half a decade ago. Uh, things are being canceled too frequently, sometimes by us, uh, but China in particular has held a lot of our crisis communications talks at risk um, as a political signal to us. Another problem is that China has had kind of a spotty record in abiding by the rules that are already on the books. Uh, they've been far too aggressive in pushing the boundaries, including uh, by things like using their naval strength to harass our ships and some really brazen aerial theatrics. Um, I think many in China itself realize that this kind of behavior is dangerous uh, and not in China's own interests. So how do we get things back on track? Well, first, I think we need to press China at a high level to bring back uh, canceled talks like the Joint Staff Dialogue Mechanism, which had promise. Uh, military to military issues were discussed by President Xi and Obama, but we need to have presidential level discussions to make the bureaucracies act. Uh, second, we need to reinstitute some operational level exercises, especially between the navies, which have completely gone away uh, in recent years, um, because those are the forces that are likely to be involved in these sorts of incidents. 
And third, we really need to take China to task for violating existing rules when they do so. Uh, and we need to do a better job of coordinating our response with allies and partners who have faced similar kinds of issues. Uh, so I think risk reduction is our top priority, but in the paper, uh, I also discuss some other US interests, uh, including using these exchanges to send messages to China at the right time uh, and using them to learn more about the notoriously opaque PLA, uh, both of which goals I think are helpful as we move into a period of competition. Um, well, let me close by saying this. I think many will question why, many in our system certainly question why we should talk to the PLA at all. Um, and there are risks. Uh, we don't want to help them get better uh, at war fighting, and we don't want them to use these sorts of exchanges um, as prestigious photo ops. But those risks, I think, has to be balanced against the danger uh, that we'd face if we let this part of the relationship wither away uh, completely. Okay, so let me stop there and face, face your assault, Avery. Well, this is an area I know a lot less about than, uh, than some of the other topics, um, so I learned a lot from the paper. Um, but you know, some things popped out at me. Uh, one was you, you talked about the usefulness, and I, I mean, I'm not impugning any of the, the work that Ryan was associated with in military, military exchanges, and uh, working on kind of codes of conduct for encounters at sea or air uh, encounters to try to avoid some of these things. But if that, if these mid-level officer exchanges were going along pretty well, then why do they seem to be irrelevant to the new uptick uh, in more aggressive interactions between China and the United States. I'm thinking in particular about the incident with, what is it, the Decatur in the South China Sea, the near collision uh, between US and Chinese naval forces. Um, shouldn't that have been the kind of thing that would have been avoided by tapping into uh, years of working on these kinds of uh, arrangements? It's a good question. I mean, my, my sense is that um, there are many, many interactions uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, these things happen frequently in terms of uh, professional and safe encounters. Uh, things like incidents involving the Decatur, I mean, these things tend to be relatively infrequent. Um, and I think we attribute on our side um, the lack of more of these sorts of incidents to the fact that we have had good discussions with the PLA. We've been clear about what we will and won't accept. And we have fairly good mechanisms for coordinating um, some of those interactions um, at the operational level. I and mean, the problem is that you know, there are things that now I think are starting to um, increase um, some types of behavior, both uh, uh, at sea and in the air. And I think we need to get back to those discussions. I think there are things that have kind of atrophied. Um, and so the question is for me, how do we um, revitalize? How do we get back to um, more steady communications? Um, and I, you know, at the end of the day, if China wants to start a war with us, they'll do so. Uh, and this isn't about that. It's really about um, accidents. It's about behaviors that are crossing a threshold a little bit too much. Um, and if we're not talking about that, then I think that sets the stage for something even worse uh, sort of down the road. So, um, you know, you began your remarks today and you mentioned in the paper, you know, looking back at the EP3 incident in 2001 and uh, the dangers and the risks that that uh, brought to light or at least uh, highlighted for a lot of people. And um, I'm wondering whether uh, the kinds of encounters that you're talking about in the South China Sea are comparable to the kinds of the risks of uh, unintended conflict that could arise from the kind of activities that the EP3 was engaged in. In other words, in the South China Sea, I presume that, and I think you say in the paper, that you don't want to stop doing this stuff just because it's risky, because you want to uphold principles of freedom of uh, navigation in international waters. You want to reassure other countries in the region that the United States is willing to stand by them uh, should China infringe on uh, their maritime and sovereignty rights. But the reconnaissance operations, are those uh, inherently all risk and very little reward? Or um, uh, you know, are those the kinds of things that could be on the table to try to you know, eliminate one category of activity where the US and China, their militaries bump up against each other and there is a risk of, of incidents? Hmm. Yeah, so I think you know, from the US point of view, you know, we've stated clearly again and again without hesitation that 
you know, we're going to operate where international allows us to. And that includes intelligence operations. It includes SROs. There are a lot of these things. I understand from a Chinese point of view that these things are quite provocative. But, you know, to be honest, the Chinese do similar things to us somewhat with less frequency today. Um, and we don't complain about it because they're allowed to do that, frankly, under international law. And so I don't see any administration, Republican or Democrat, being willing to make some sort of a deal where we hold back, we stop um, exercising those rights under international law just simply because uh, you know, it creates a possibility for an accident. I think what we're trying to encourage the Chinese to do is to um, use their rights as well, but not be theatrical and not press the boundaries so that they're creating the risk of an accident. Okay. Um, so you talk about the way in which these exchanges, military to military exchanges can be useful and other kinds of military event, uh, exchange events. Um, can be useful as a way of signaling each side and sending messages and learning and, and all those things. Uh, but you also do mention something that used to be a real problem and less seems to be less frequently a problem today, which is that one side or the other would cancel exchanges or cancel joint, you know, joint exercises, whatever you want to call it, um, in order to express their unhappiness about some policy. And on the Chinese side, it was often American decisions to sell arms or do something with Taiwan that the Chinese side didn't like, and they would they would cancel uh, some set of exchanges. Um, and you know, I saw that happen a lot, and you know, I guess maybe it's happened a little bit recently, but I'm wondering, does that ever work for either country? Does, do canceling these things ever cause the other side to alter its policies in ways that the cancellation was intended uh, to, you know, to cause? Or uh, is this simply, again, uh, playing to the domestic audience? Hmm. Frankly speaking, I think more the latter. Uh, I think, you know, especially on the Chinese point of view, they're trying to look for things that they can do that have little, little consequence. Many of the kinds of exchanges they've canceled have been, you know, fairly insignificant. We, uh, you know, as you remember from a couple of years ago, and I talked about this in the paper, we sort of disinvited China from attending one of our major exercises, uh, RIMPAC. Uh, and, you know, we can ask the question, did that make any difference at all? Um, you know, it certainly played to our domestic audience. Um, but if the point of that was to deter China or dissuade them from doing more in the South China Sea, it didn't. Um, frankly, it didn't. Um, you know, and so I'm, from a strategic point of view, I'm skeptical. I'm a skeptic that these cancellations matter. And frankly speaking, when the Chinese cancel things, they get into crisis talks. That's where I think it really matters. Um, and I think they, they should understand, and many of them do, um, that we need to keep some of those lines of communication open. Okay, so one last question, i run over just a little here. Um, you talk about um, the fact that some of the, these exchanges have become more difficult, more fraught as great comp power competition heats up between the US and China. And I'm wondering why that should be the case, because in fact, uh, military, military communications exchanges and various sorts of arrangements seem to really uh, become more fruitful and richer between the US and the Soviet Union as the Cold War really set in and became routinized and it was clearly great power competition. Why is, why is it not the case in the US-China relationship that intensifying great power competition doesn't lead both sides to realize the necessity of making these exchanges uh, more productive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also a good question. I mean, I think, you know, with respect to the Soviet Union, there had been a lot of really, really bad and dangerous incidents that had happened in the 1960s. By 1972, when they signed INCSI, we're actually moving into a period of detente. So the relationship seemed to be heading in somewhat of a different direction. Now we're sort of going in the opposite direction. We're heading towards strategic rivalry. And so a lot of people, especially those that are sort of outside this particular community are asking the question, why should we talk to them? Are we not just simply enabling them? Um, and they perhaps don't understand that we do a pretty good job in mitigating those risks. Um, we do a pretty good job in focusing on areas of risk reduction that are important to us and to the Chinese. Um, and that um, things like, you know, opening up our system in a way that would advantage them militarily, um, I think you know that's, that concern has been overstated and it's not very well understood by some parties. Great, thanks. It makes it sound like uh, we have to wait uh, for the United States and China to go through some difficult times before they get to that point where they want to reduce rivalry and uh, perhaps the risks associated with uh, their great power competition. Uh, it reminds me of uh, Jessica's point about in the long run, uh, nationalism will not serve China's interests, but let's hope we're around for the long run.
Um, okay, last, uh, but certainly not least, is the paper by Fiona Cunningham, uh, which is entitled, um, in the uh, Is the Nuclear Genie Out of the Bottle? Strategic Stability in U.S.-China Relations. So Fiona, um, you want to take it for a few minutes? Okay, well, I will start by echoing all of my panel, uh, fellow panelists and thanking Avery, Jacques, and Mason for inviting me to be a part of this project and my other panelists. And to tell everybody who's tuning in for a national security panel to make sure that you tune in for the other webinars as well, because there's some really terrific and interesting work there as well. Um, okay, so back to my paper. Uh, the thing that I'm really focused on here is that in the last 12 months or so, the US-China nuclear relationship has kind of gone from the back page, if you like, to the front page news. Perhaps most prominently with uh, US efforts to try to induce uh, Chinese participation in nuclear arms control with Russia. And this should be kind of ringing alarm bells for anybody who's familiar with how prominent nuclear weapons and nuclear competition was during the Cold War uh, with the Soviet Union and the United States. So I was motivated to sort of look at well, what, what's new, uh, what's the problem, and how can it be fixed? So there are three things I want to highlight. The first is that there are long-standing risks of nuclear arms racing and nuclear use in the US-China relationship. So many of the things that we're seeing filling our front pages are not necessarily new, um, but what is new, what is propelling these issues, I think, to the front page is the context in which these risks are playing out and which they're perceived. And that is a deteriorating US-China uh, political relationship, of course, but also there are these slow moving trends in nuclear modernization in both countries, which were set in motion often a decade ago. Um, and the unraveling of uh, US-Russia arms control and all of these things sort of put together are putting the nuclear element of the US-China relationship into sharper relief than it has been in the past. So the second thing uh, that I wanted to hit on is that these uh, risks of nuclear arms racing and nuclear use in the US-China relationship are really resulting from a host of asymmetries in the relationship. And asymmetries can create incentives for countries to use nuclear weapons and for arms racing uh, for fairly obvious reasons, if you're the disadvantaged party by some asymmetry, you might try to compensate uh, for that by using uh, or threatening to use nuclear weapons. You might try and compensate uh, for a lack of arsenal size or sophistication by arms racing. And if you're advantaged by those asymmetries, then you're going to want to try to keep your edge. Uh, and there are five main asymmetries that I point to in the paper in the US-China uh, relationship. There are asymmetries of geography, where conflicts between the US and China are likely to take place in China's backyard, not the US's necessarily. US alliance commitments in East Asia, how the two countries use uh, their non-nuclear strategic weapons like cyber attacks and missile defense, the conventional military balance, but perhaps most significantly, the asymmetry in nuclear arsenal size and sophistication. Uh, the latest US government report suggests China has warheads in the 200s, uh, but does uh, suggest they'll double them within the next decade, but even so, that's going to be less than half of what the US currently fields, which is roughly somewhere around 1,700 warheads with thousands more in stockpile. So the third point I make in the paper is that the US and China do have mutual interests in cooperating to reduce these risks, but if they try to follow the US-Soviet playbook for getting to the bargaining table, uh, this could actually create more problems than it fixes. So this push for arms control could be potentially counterproductive. Before the US and Soviet Union sat down at the negotiating table as very nicely segued and, and, and pointed to in the previous discussion, um, they went through a series of harrowing crises in the 60s and the Soviet Union significantly built up its nuclear arsenal. So it seems that what you need for deterrence and what you need to feel co uh, com to be confident cooperating with your adversary might be two quite different things. So if China and the United States follow down that pathway, then we're looking at one of two not particularly good futures. One uh, is a perpetual period of dangerous nuclear crises if China decides that it won't build up its nuclear arsenal, or alternatively, uh, a Chinese nuclear buildup, which could create a whole set of new problems in the relationship. So what I argue uh, as a potential solution to this issue is that uh, the US and China could be a bit more creative in how they think about managing their strategic relationship. Because the overall relationship that includes not just nuclear weapons, but also things like the two countries' cyber capabilities, conventional long-range strike, their missile defense capabilities, 
ability to attack uh, space assets. If you put all of these things together, the two countries have a lot more ways to hold each other at risk than the nuclear comparison would suggest. And recognizing that kind of symmetry, despite the nuclear asymmetry, could give the two countries a kind of basis to move forward with cooperating uh, in some areas where I think they could reduce nuclear risks. And there are some concrete proposals that uh, experts in both countries have put on the table. So things could be a lot worse uh, than they presently are in the US-China nuclear relationship. Uh, but both states could try to make, uh, could actually make that situation worse by uh, trying to make it better. Okay, uh, well, let me pick up with uh, where you left off, which is this idea that um, although there's this stark asymmetry in terms of nuclear capabilities, because in fact, the strategic equation includes more than just nuclear weapons, uh, that the overall strategic balance might be less asymmetrical, if not perfectly symmetric. And that by uh, linking these things together, bundling them, whatever you want to call it, uh, mm -hmm. there may be an opening there for reaching uh, agreements that would increase stability during a confrontation and reduce the incentives for, for arms racing. Um, I think your, your argument on that score is objectively airtight. It identifies the rationality of doing this. And as with most of the papers, we asked for policy recommendations. So you've got a strong normative argument, basically saying, you idiots, why don't you do this? Um, <laughs> but it you know, kind of begs the question in my mind, um, these are all the reasons they should do this, but are there actors on both sides who have incentives to actually do it? In other words, even if we think they should do these things, should we expect that they actually will? Look, I think uh, there are a lot of elements to answering that question. Uh, some of those go to, I'll start kind of with the, the, the strategic, the rational incentives, if you like, of what is there to cooperate in? Because of course, you know, having a larger nuclear arsenal, not limiting your capabilities in this particular way, they'll bring certain advantages to the table, right, for countries potentially when they're involved in crises, including the US and China. So I think the first point is, you know, do they really have an incentive to cooperate? And I do think that there are two areas in which the US and China do have, you know, in some ways, not a lot to lose from cooperating. And one is not entering into an arms race. And the second is clearing up some of the misperceptions over when they might actually use nuclear weapons. Um, and so speaking to the first one, uh, I, I think back to the kind of 1970s and late 1960s analogy with the US's entry into arms control negotiations, that it, it, it costs a lot of money to do an arms race. Uh, and this is something that's, that's clearly recognized on the Chinese side and some of the writings, despite what the Global Times uh, uh, editor has suggested. Uh, but it's something that I think uh, the United States has long recognized that forms of arms control can at least limit or channel competition into areas where countries feel like they actually can put up the resources to do so. So I think that's one element where there is a mutual interest in, in preventing uh, something that neither can sort of necessarily afford and sort of channeling competition in ways that, that both feel like they, they might be able to, to have something to gain. And the second comes to misperceptions about when the two countries might use uh, nuclear weapons. Um, you know, I think both China and the US leverage certain ambiguities about when they'd use nuclear weapons to protect uh, themselves from, in China's case, attacks on its, uh, its conventional missile capabilities, and in the US case, on its, uh, its nuclear command and control capabilities. Um, and uh, I think sometimes those uh, ambiguities can lead to either broader or narrower interpretations by the other country about circumstances in which they might use nuclear weapons and they're dangerous for, for, for uh, different uh, reasons. Uh, so that's kind of the strategic piece that I think there are some really clear common interests there. But, um, you know, there are, there are other reasons why countries choose not to cooperate that have to do with not having the right teams to negotiate these kinds of questions. And I think that's definitely something on the Chinese side of, um, you know, even with the purely nuclear dialogue, having a group of people who feel uh, uh, comfortable negotiating that uh, particular set of questions. Uh, but also, I think, uh, you know, I cite in the paper sort of three reasons why I think China has been reluctant to take up cooperation with the US. The one is this dispute over what's included in strategic stability, which I've tried to articulate an answer for, but others being calls for transparency that they might feel not comfortable with because of the smaller nuclear arsenal. 
uh, and also the political relationships. So getting to some of the things that, uh, that Joel has mentioned too about using these things as tools. And one thing that uh, the worsening political relationship suggests is that, you know, um, uh, some of these risks are too big to be ignored. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, some of the arguments employed in the past might not uh, hang around going forward. So uh, last question before we uh, open it up, and maybe as I'm asking this question, I'll remind the audience that um, uh, you can post your questions in the Q&A and then uh, after uh, Fiona answers this question, we're gonna try to uh, field these questions and I'll pose them to the panel. Uh, but the last question here is, uh, we obviously know more about uh, debates over um, arms policy, arms procurement, you know, lobbying and whatnot in the United States. And um, we know something about the role that uh, experts play in advising American, American policymakers con through congressional staff or, uh, you know, actual act civilians working in, uh, in the U.S. government who have an academic background. I wonder if you could tell us something, because I know you've consumed this literature and you interact with these folks, how you see things on the Chinese side. Who are the lobbyists? You know, who are the, the, who are the vested interests in terms of uh, the military, perhaps industrial interests, um, who play, who are influential in shaping China's, what would be China's view to the kinds of proposals you're making for arms control talks, negotiations, uh, and how important and influential are experts, academic experts on the Chinese side? Um, well, I have to caveat this just by saying that one of the casualties of uh, worsening political relations in recent years is diminishing the ability to have exchanges to really keep a finger on the pulse of who has influence on these questions within China. So I can speak from uh, knowledge that's maybe a couple of years old here, but um, I think the main constituencies on nuclear strategy within uh, China are the uh, nuclear weapons laboratories, who uh, I think historically have had a really outsized role in influencing nuclear strategy and influencing how Chinese leaders thought about these questions. Um, and then there is obviously the um, rocket force within the military, which has had a historically a much lower um, level of influence, but that has been rising over time. And there were some questions when it was elevated from being just a branch of the PLA to a service in 2015, 16, if that meant a greater role for uh, the rocket force. They've obviously been joined by the Navy and now the Air Force and having an influence on Chinese nuclear strategy. So you have a couple more players. Um, and, uh, and finally, there is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that has an influence over arms control and, and that kind of set of negotiations and certainly did over China's participation in nuclear test ban uh, treaty in the late 1990s. But again, query over whether they have as much influence now. Um, in terms of experts outside of those particular institutions, there's a number of, uh, of think tanks and some universities within uh, China that also uh, have influence on some of these questions. I would cite in particular Tsinghua University has a strong arms control program, uh, but the picture looks different and even more complicated once you start to bring in the space and the cyber aspects in particular. Um, and I should mention defense industry as well, uh, obviously uh, has, has a say. Um, but uh, you'd probably be looking at having the Cybersecurity Administration of China and aspects of uh, the strategic support force, so the elements that are looking after Chinese space and cyber strategy um, are also involved if you were to look at it from a broader perspective. Okay, great, thanks. So we do have a few questions um, and uh, apologies to the people who pose these questions if I uh, uh, revise them slightly in the interest of time. Uh, but the first question that came in, um, and I guess I will not, you can see it, but I won't identify the person who posed the question. Uh, it, it aims at a Joel, um, and she notes that um, uh, your remarks focused on negative trends in China's behavior uh, with respect to crisis communications in recent years, but points out that there's been a significant uptick in US uh, surveillance and reconnaissance operations along China's coast. Also, um, uh, more uh, phone, uh, freedom of navigation operations undertaken by the United States with a lot of publicity, and wonders, is there possible, um, are there things the United States could do uh, to reduce the risks of unintended uh, or unwanted encounters at sea or in the air um, by reducing uh, the frequency, or even, uh, even without negotiating, but uh, perhaps through negotiating, 
a reduction in the frequency of these operations that the Chinese find provocative. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, for the question. And it's, it's similar to Avery's question earlier. You know, I think, frankly speaking, whether it's a Democratic or Republican administration unilaterally scaling back our SROs off China's coast, um, I just don't see the scope for that. Um, I think it, you know, for policymakers, it would look like a sign of weakness um, when it, the opposite is sort of the incentive is to show strength. Um, what you say in principle makes sense. We want to find some way to mutually coexist in a safe way. Um, I think that is absolutely um, right. Um, but again, it just seems to me that the political scope for such a accommodation or a deal um, is, is, is very, very hard to see. Um, it's very hard to see. And I think we have to be able to live with the reality that we're going to be operating in close proximity uh, to the PLA for, for years to come. And we have to find a way to do that safely, in my view, through agreements on crisis communications. Okay, the second question uh, actually touches on something we didn't touch much on in this panel. Um, there will be a, a panel on trade and economics later uh, in the series. Um, but it, and it focuses mostly on this question of uh, rare earth elements in China's um, uh, near monopoly on these things that might be vital for not just industry, but for the US military. So why don't I broaden the question a bit and let whoever on the panel wants to field it, field it, which is, um, you know, is there a need for the United States to design a policy that reduces American dependence on supply chains that are largely rooted in China uh, for key uh, inputs for the American economy and the military that could be seen as a security concern? Jump in, whoever wants to jump in. I mean, I, I, yeah. I will just add very quickly that I think it, some of these policies are already in play, perhaps not necessarily with the rare earth elements, but uh, one could look at, you know, this isn't even a reliance upon China, but uh, the important role of uh, certain Taiwanese manufacturers of advanced computer chips uh, and some of the negotiations that have been taking place to bring some of that manufacturing to the United States. So not even within China, but within the range of over a thousand Chinese ballistic missiles, if you like. Um, so I think that these kinds of policies or questions are afoot and the, the interesting point for the United States and allied decision makers as well going forward will be, you know, just where do you draw the line between uh, what's a crucial, you know, militarily important aspect of a supply chain and what is what is not. Anybody else want to jump in on that one or should we move on to the next question? Um, it's actually kind of a comment uh, for those of you who see it in the Q&A panel there. Uh, and I'll try to uh, make it a little bit shorter. Uh, but basically it's the argument that uh, something that's been largely unaddressed in this panel is to ask um, the context for thinking about these national security challenges uh, that face the United States or American policymakers, which is to say uh, there, are, there are budgets uh, and there's other political priorities for the United States. To what extent does it make sense to, um, and this is, that's a leading question, Lee, but I don't wanna undermine its importance. Um, you know, to what extent uh, will American policy towards China that tries to deal with American security concerns posed by China be constrained or limited by other priorities the United States faces and budgetary limitations the United States government has to deal with? And if you want in particular to focus on this question of building up American naval assets uh, in Asia. Avery, I can uh, provide lead off and hopefully others can follow uh, to amplify or, or round out the, the picture. But I, I think that it's a really important question and I'm glad that Bob raised it. Um, we have a tendency in the United States to, you know, sort of fall for 10 foot, 10 foot tall syndrome, where we sort of assume that our adversaries are 10 feet tall, can predict the future, can, can look around mountains. And, uh, you know, the reality is that China faces enorm enormous challenges itself. And uh, I think that we need to have a bit of modesty in our projections of China's future as well as our own. Uh, I think that we also need to recognize that we are in a long-term systems competition with China where prestige will be derived from performance. And a lot of the performance that matters in our competition with China and the contest for global leadership is how the United States acts itself. 
uh, how it addresses its own domestic shortcomings, um, whether it is able to continue to spur innovation, whether we're able to continue attracting the best and brightest minds, uh, whether our capital systems continue to be liquid and, and efficient, um, you know, how, how uh, transparent and predictable our legal systems are. There are a lot of elements to this competition that um, are completely independent of China. And I, I would love to see us uh, investing a little bit more of our collective national focus on um, restoring the sources of our strength. Uh, our alliance networks, um, you know, the, the role of the United States is a, is a moral and economic leader in the world. Our capacity for um, addressing uh, serious systemic and social challenges at home. Uh, these will play a critical role in our competition with China. Final thought before I pause and hand it off to others is um, that I think that implicitly what Bob's question raises is a question about the value and virtue of great power competition as the organizing principle of all American foreign policy. Uh, it's a principle that is useful for mobilizing uh, the American to sort of be cognizant of and responsive to the threat and challenge that China poses, but it's not a cost-free concept. Uh, you know, in previous periods of great power competition, uh, they have been accompanied by arms racing and bloating of defense budgets. Um, this would, just as a practical matter, uh, starve resources for other national priorities that we have. It would push the United States to view China as an enduring enemy for the long term uh, that we would need to prevail over. Um, and it would, I think, distort the way by which we were able to view our friends, uh, leading to sort of impulses to see countries as either with us or against us in this great power competition with China. So um, my, my goal isn't to, you know, drive a spike through the idea of great power competition, but just to try to force us to reckon with some of the, the costs that come along with the, the concept. So the next question, uh, unless somebody else wants to jump in on that one, uh, isn't directed at Jessica, but I'm gonna direct it at Jessica. Uh, and it really uh, talks, it's, it's uh, from someone who, uh, was, came to the United States many years ago as, uh, from China as a student. Uh, but I think the, observ the central observation here is that um, the United States um, and also perhaps China tend to formulate policy as though the other side is in a sense monolithic in terms of its views of the, the relationship. Uh, the, United, the American uh, tendency under the Trump administration to talk about uh, China as the, Chi or the Chinese Communist Party as the counterpart for American China policy uh, and to ignore some of the internal divisions. Now, Jessica, in your paper, you talk about the differences of opinion uh, in these debates, but this question um, is not just about the kind of the, the horizontal differences of opinion, but this person's raising the question of maybe there are generational differences um, and that the United States is locking into policies, uh, and maybe China's locking into policies based on their views that reflect their generational experiences. And the argument in the question is that among young people in China, uh, people think differently, maybe have, are more open-minded. Uh, I don't know if you want to speculate about younger generations in the United States and how they might view China, but I thought maybe this would be something you could talk a little bit about, the, the generational differences in opinion about the relationship. I think there are absolutely important generational differences in China, both in terms of why you know, young people might join the the Chinese Communist Party, uh, as well as their views about and expectations for the Chinese government's performance. I think one of the things that surveys show is that Chinese are a less, the younger generations are less reflexively nationalistic in the sense that they are less inclined to view uh, you know, China as inherently superior to other countries. Um, and so in that sense, they're less inclined to give the government the benefit of the doubt. They're, they're less deferential. But they are no less nationalistic in the sense of having uh, more hawkish attitudes, uh, sort of greater expectations that the Chinese government will use China's increased uh, you know, material and global stature to achieve something, to lead globally. So there's also a changing, I think, expectation or a, a stronger expectation amongst younger generations uh, that, that, that this, there should be more performance. Um, and so rather than an intrinsic uh, sort of support 
So that can cut, I think, a number of different ways. And but I, I will say that I do think it's it's very important to keep in mind that, you know, opinions change, right? Even within generations, that you no, know, these ideas are malleable, um, but are also influenced by events. And one of the real, I think, sort of travesties of U.S.-China relations is that, you know, for the longest time, it was, you know, Japan was the real kind of other, uh, where there was just, you know, virulent kind of nationalist sentiment born of the legacy of World War II. And, you know, I'm concerned that this period in which, uh, you know, apparently even racial animus and, you know, phrases like the Chinese flu or a Chinese virus, that this is actually going to be injecting a racial element into, uh, you know, existing uh, tensions between the United States and China and really hardening uh, opinion inside and outside China, because I think the Chinese diaspora also is a very important uh, factor um, in this competition for talent, if you will, uh, and the brain drain that, um, again, the, what Ryan was talking about, these other elements, it's not a straight military competition of the kind that the United States and the Soviet Union faced during the Cold War, right? This is a much more set of interdependent uh, transnational um, components, including the flow of people. And so, the impact of what we do um, in terms of the attitudes of, of generations inside and outside of, of China, I think will matter in determining which system ends up performing better for the long haul. Okay. Uh, question for Fiona uh, from Mike McDevitt. Um, and basically I think the question is, as the United States has emphasized the importance of bringing China into arms control negotiations over nuclear capabilities, does this really create an opportunity for China to say, oh, you want us to join the club? You want us to engage in negotiations? Well, then, um, you know, we then are going to insist on having the right to build up to a capability comparable to what you've got, that we're not going to lock ourselves into inferiority. In other words, is the American position, in fact, creating the opportunity for China to feel justified in building up if it chooses to do so, whether or not it would choose to do so? I'm not sure that the the US proposals in that manner have thought about that, you know, what the invitation suggests to China in terms of what's acceptable for its arsenal size that carefully. My sense is that the invitations have really been in, you know, an attempt to get China to lock into its current sort of set of arsenal size uh, constraints, which a number of, I think, former US officials have said is, is seems very hard to imagine would be in their interests. But it does, it could be read in that way as that kind of an invitation. And given that China's choice not to build up to that degree is really being a, a, a sort of result of China's self-restraint, I think that uh, US approaches to um, strategic stability with China should be about trying to lock in that strategic, uh, that sort of self-restraint rather than uh, inadvertently creating incentives or justifications for China to grow its arsenal so that it can come to the table as an equal. And we have another question um, for Jessica, which um, is basically you recommend the United States avoid, avoid the counterproductive provocation uh, of Chinese nationalism. Uh, but the questioner wants to know, is it realistic to avoid provoking China as long as China is so active and ambitious uh, in terms of its global policies? Isn't the United States going to have to adopt postures that will inevitably trigger Chinese nationalist reactions? That's a great question. And I think that there is a real fine line between deterrence and provocation. So take the example of the current discussion over whether the United States ought to revise the policy of strategic ambiguity uh, in its attitude towards a cross strait potential cross strait conflict. And there, I think that the one of the real concerns that many have raised most recently in foreign affairs about the proposal for an unambiguous commitment to Taiwan's defense is this would be more provocative than it would be uh, adding to uh, deterrence that right now it doesn't look like Beijing is ready to uh, uh, prepared to imminently you know use force to achieve its long-term objective of reunification. But if in changing U.S. declaratory policy, the counterproductive result is that Beijing does change its calculus in, in regards that it needs to change. Uh, prevent this uh, change in the status quo, that will have been counterproductive. Uh, 
None of this is to say the United States should not be continuing to work on this issue to urge both sides uh, to avoid uh, you know, unilateral changes to the status quo, but that's a status quo that has served to preserve the peace and, and you know, such as it is for decades. And so that's, for, I think, one of the, the latest example of ways in which there's a very, I think, n need for this calibration where in rushing to push back against China, we don't actually step tip over um, into, you know, kicking Beijing so hard that they lash out prematurely, I would say. Okay, what, what, one last question. It's going to have to be our last question because of time, but it, and it's a really tough one. I'm not sure who's going to want to take it. I suspect that uh, Ryan might want to uh, field this one, uh, but anybody's welcome to jump in. And it's this question of given um, developments in the United States in terms of um, social justice, social unrest, et cetera, um, has this dramatically affected the moral credibility of the United States in ways that um, makes it diff complicates US-China policy, uh, or perhaps complicates China's uh, views of the United States in ways that are detrimental to American interests? Well, uh, Avery, since you invoked my name, I will try to provide a very brief response, uh, mindful of our time, but I welcome others to as well. Um, you know, the reality is that uh, it's never been a secret that the United States isn't perfect. We've never been perfect, but we've always valid, we've always been able to, in spite of our uh, shortcomings, demonstrate that we're willing to grapple with them to form a more perfect union. Uh, I don't see why this instance has to be different than any of the ones that preceded it. Uh, the, the point, though, is that we need to be able to demonstrate credibly that we, as a country, take seriously these social rifts that are so visible to everyone else around the world and are prepared to work on them. Uh, as long as we do that, uh, I think that it is still entirely credible for us to stand up and speak up uh, for values, principles, rule of law, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, that's who we are. Uh, it's sort of definitional to our national character, and I, I uh, strongly expect and hope that that will continue. Anybody else on the panel want to leap in? I will just add one brief thought on this, which is a question of does the, the United States have moral credibility to whom? And um, speaking for with my Australian hat on, uh, the it, it's a it's a relative question as well. How do you deal with the moral uh, issues that are, arise in one society? And for third party countries that might be looking at the United States or China, I think. Um, the United States probably comes out vastly on top with how it deals with its imperfections. Okay. Uh, well, our, our uh, participant from Australia is going to get the last word on U.S.-China relations today. I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank members of the audience who have stuck with us throughout the, uh, the entire session uh, and remind you that the papers are available uh, through the links on the website that you can find in the chat function or you can go to the website for the uh, project on the future of U.S.-China relations at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and in addition, I encourage you to come back for these future webinars on Fridays that will deal with uh, topics other than just national security in the coming weeks. So uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, thanks to panelists. And I hope to see people here next week. Bye-bye.